Brittany Stikes was born on May 4, 1991, to parents Mary and David Dotson and grew up on a farm in Ripley, Ohio. Brittany loved spending time with her family, working with farm animals, riding horses, working on cars with her father, and they would often go to drag races together. She even wanted to build herself a custom motorcycle one day. In 2011, 20-year-old Brittany was working at Subway, and that's where she met 38-year-old Shane Stikes. Within a year, they married, and she became a stepmother to his two children and was pregnant with her first child. By the age of 22, Brittany and Shane were living in Georgetown, Ohio, and she was five months pregnant with their second child. Brittany had an extremely close relationship with her parents and would go to their house nearly daily while Shane was working. On August 28, 2013, Brittany texted her father to wish him a happy birthday and said she would stop by that evening to see him. She and her young daughter spent most of the day at her mother-in-law's house in Bethel because Brittany wanted to apply for employment with the IRS. Afterward, they stayed for dinner. At 7.15 p.m., Brittany texted her parents to let them know she was on her way. However, they would never arrive. At 7.30 p.m., a person driving down Highway 68 noticed headlights in a wooded area and turned around to see if they needed help. He had no idea he was about to stumble onto a crime scene. Inside a bright yellow Jeep was Brittany, who had been shot and was found slumped over the steering wheel. Her daughter Aubrey was still alive and was crying for her mom, but also suffered a bullet wound. Sadly, Brittany and her unborn child were both declared dead at the scene. Aubrey was rushed to Cincinnati Children's Hospital and thankfully made a full recovery. Investigators began searching for surveillance footage and found her Jeep on the Georgetown Police Department's footage and the McDonald's on Ohio 125. However, they saw no evidence explaining what happened and never saw anyone following her. Whoever murdered Brittany shot inside her Jeep four times. Brittany's parents lived so close to the accident scene they could hear the sirens going off in the distance. Concerned, her father David drove to where the sirens were but wasn't allowed near the scene. However, it wasn't long before he received the devastating news. By 11.30 p.m., law enforcement arrived at the couple's home and informed her husband Shane about the incident and he was taken in for questioning. Shane was looked at immediately but had a solid alibi. He had been at work all day, and at the time of the shooting, he was at the gym 15 minutes away in Decatur, Ohio. They also checked for gunshot residue, and the results were negative. He also agreed to take multiple polygraphs and passed every one of them. Shane has since said that he has known since day one who killed his wife, but could not provide the evidence to prove it, and the person's identity has never been revealed to the public. The coroner didn't find gunshot residue at the site of the murder, indicating Brittany was not shot at close range. Robbery was also ruled out because she still had all of her jewelry and about $125 in cash on her. Two years after the shooting, a witness came forward with information about a suspect, a motive, and knowledge of the case that went well beyond that of the general public. She said she was in the passenger seat of a car with her ex-boyfriend, Tommy Lopez, on August 28, 2013, when he spotted a yellow Jeep Wrangler at a gas station and started following it. About 25 minutes later, she said he plugged a portable blue police light into the car's cigarette lighter and waved Brittany off U.S. Route 68 near Goose Lake Road. She was scared of him and only decided to come forward after he was jailed in Kentucky on drug charges. The ex-girlfriend said Lopez exited his vehicle and shot Brittany several times after she pulled over. The witness said he knew exactly who she was and shot them in retaliation for her husband's drug debt, but Shane denied being involved with drugs. She also said she knew of other people that Lopez had killed. Shortly before Brittany's murder, Lopez allegedly murdered 18-year-old Michaela Bride in her Fort Mitchell, Kentucky home. He allegedly killed another person because the man had sold drugs to a previous girlfriend of his who died from an overdose. 
The police obtained a search warrant for his property and allegedly were searching for a post-mortem photo of Brittany that Lopez supposedly took as a keepsake. However, Shane doesn't believe the witness because Brittany's vehicle showed clear signs that it was still moving when she was shot and not at a dead stop. Plus, the damage to the front of her Jeep was consistent with an impact. Shane then explained that he believed someone had paced alongside Brittany in the car and fired at her. After Brittany was shot, Shane believes the car veered into the embankment, causing the vehicular damage. Over the years, the suspicions surrounding Lopez have died down. An informant had also allegedly told police that someone paid $20,000 to have Brittany murdered. However, no evidence has ever been found to back up this story. At some point, a home was searched an hour and a half away from where Brittany was murdered in Falmouth, Kentucky. Investigators collected 19 pieces of evidence and said the search was successful. Unfortunately, even with Shane's solid alibi, he said Brittany's parents still pointed the finger at him and eventually it soured their relationship. Sadly, as of 2023, Brittany's murder remains unsolved. Hey y'all, I want to take a real quick moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Factor. Do you find yourself too busy to cook this fall, but still want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, you can skip the extra trip to the grocery store along with the chopping, prepping, and cleanup. Plus, you'll be eating foods that taste amazing. Factor's meals are fresh and never frozen and can be ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat it up and enjoy. What I love most about Factor is the convenience. I work full-time as a nurse and content creator, so my time is very limited. With Factor, it cuts down on my grocery store trips and cooking, so there's more time to provide y'all with intriguing true crime stories. On top of that, I can easily adjust my order size or even skip a week when I'm out of town. Plus, you can round out your meal and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of 45 plus add-ons or for an easy wellness boost. Try their refreshing beverage options like cold pressed juices, shakes, and smoothies. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered right to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Also, Factor is now owned by HelloFresh, and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. You already know I love HelloFresh, and now I can switch between brands, and y'all can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. So what are you waiting for? Head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code SGCS50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. That's 50% off your first Factor box by going to Factor75.com and using my code SGCS50. Holly Page Kreider was born on December 15, 1978. In 2017, 38-year-old Holly was living with her boyfriend, Marty Smith, at 531 Burns Street in Mansfield, Ohio. She had three teenage children and had been separated from their father. However, since moving in with Marty, he had basically isolated her from her family. Unfortunately, Holly was suffering from poor health and was in desperate need of a lung transplant. Due to this, she was dependent on supplemental oxygen and was also battling drug addiction. She also had no money or a vehicle to get around, making it even easier for Marty to isolate her. On March 25, 2017, Holly strangely disappeared from her home while Marty claimed he was an hour away in Newark, Ohio. By March 30th, when there was still no word from Holly, her husband reported her missing. He had been trying to contact her since the middle of March, but waited to report her missing because she had a history of leaving but would always return. Marty was then questioned and told investigators he believed she met someone on the internet and left with them. The only problem with this story is that she left behind all her belongings, including her oxygen and medication. There's also a theory that she overdosed, but her family doesn't believe this either and suspects that Marty was involved in her disappearance. 
After her disappearance, Marty moved out of the apartment, saying he felt Holly wasn't coming back and allegedly threw out all of her belongings. Investigators interviewed several witnesses who reported seeing Holly being pushed into Marty's black truck as she tried to get out, but these claims have not been confirmed. Despite having numerous cameras in and around his apartment, he claimed they were disconnected when she left. In the weeks following her disappearance, multiple neighbors and acquaintances were told by Marty that Holly had been found safe, but that simply wasn't true. He has also refused to take a polygraph exam. Unfortunately, as of 2023, Holly has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Megan Nicole Lancaster was born on October 24, 1987. In 2013, 25-year-old Megan lived in Wheelersburg, Ohio, and had a 7-year-old son. However, due to her drug addiction, her son was in the care of his grandmother. On April 3, 2013, Megan was supposed to run errands and return to her parents' house that night, but she never arrived there. She called her mother at about 7.30 p.m. and said she was hanging out with some friends, but sadly, this would be the last time she would ever speak to her daughter again. Two days later, her white Mustang was found abandoned at a Rally's hamburger in Portsmouth, Ohio. Inside, investigators found her wallet on the passenger seat, but her cell phone was missing along with her. Her family stated that despite her addiction problem, she adored her son and was in daily contact with her relatives before her disappearance. On April 6, 2013, the day after Megan's car was found, her brother Jeremy and sister-in-law Katie received a phone call from a cousin of theirs saying that Megan was tied up in room 116 at a local motel. My husband and I got a call from their cousin and he just said, I need you to get out to this hotel. Megan's in one of these rooms and that she was tied to a bed. It was like, oh my gosh, we've got to get there. And so when we arrived at this hotel, my husband went and knocked on what could potentially have been death's door. He risked his life not knowing if there were machine guns or whatever on the other side. 116 is the door that we knocked on. And two men answered the door and my husband said, I heard my sister was here. Do you guys have her? Well, they wouldn't let him see in the room except just to the bed. Then when we got home, another phone call comes in. It was an anonymous call, we don't know who it was said that Megan was tied to a bed, but in room 210, and that she heard her brother outside, and that she was screaming for him. And um, she was no longer there. They said that um, she had been taken out in a bag, but that she's still alive. So we watched this place for days, and we started noticing things like the two guys, one of them had a big suburban and he would always be outside shining the wheels and dollar bill, dollar bill is his name. Investigators believe Megan's disappearance may be connected to the disappearances of Jamie Bowen, Holly Logan, Wanda Lamonds, and Charlotte Trago, and the deaths of Tamika Lynch and Tiffany Sayre. All these women were young mothers who struggled with drug addiction, and some resorted to prostitution to support their habit. Several of them attended the same rehab center in Scioto County and had mutual acquaintances. Charlotte and Tamika were friends who went missing on the same day, May 3, 2014. Tamika's body was found in Paint Creek three weeks after her disappearance, and her autopsy determined she had multiple drugs in her system and died from an overdose. However, investigators found her death to be suspicious. Tiffany's body was found in a creek on June 19th, and her death was ruled a homicide. It's possible that a serial killer could be behind all these disappearances and deaths, but no suspects have ever been named in any of the cases. 
After Megan's disappearance, Katie found a list of names and phone numbers in a series of color-coded notebooks among her belongings. Some entries had notations beside them, such as dance for or men who give money. Among the names in the notebook was Michael Mirren, an attorney and former Portsmouth City Councilman. In October 2020, Mirren was arrested on 18 charges, including human trafficking, racketeering, and promoting prostitution, with six victims involved. However, he was not named a suspect or person of interest in Megan's disappearance, but her family believes he's responsible for her disappearance and presumed homicide. On October 2, 2021, Katie was sadly found deceased at a home in the 1100 block of 4th Street in Portsmouth. The cause of her death has not been made public, and I did a thorough search and never found anything. However, it's well known that Katie was a driving force in finding Megan, getting justice for her, and exposing local corruption and human trafficking. Less than three months later, right before Mirren was scheduled to stand trial for the nearly 20 charges, he would die in a hospital from health complications. Megan's loved ones continued to believe that Mirren was involved in her disappearance. However, as of 2023, she has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Nikki Lynn Forrest was born on November 29, 1990. When she was 12 years old, her mother sadly passed away. Afterward, her former stepmother, Tammy Weddington, convinced her ex-husband, Nikki's father, to give her custody as he was unfit to parent her alone. At the age of 19, Nikki was four and a half months pregnant but had previously suffered three miscarriages. Because of that, she was required to take injections twice a day in order to prevent another miscarriage. On September 25, 2010, Nikki and Tammy got into an argument. Nikki wasn't happy about Tammy's rules, so she packed her things and left. She then traveled eight miles to her friend's home on Trade Square West. It's unclear how she got there as she didn't have a car. After leaving her friend's home, she walked three blocks to her boyfriend's home, who was possibly the father of her unborn child. After arriving, the two got into an argument, so he put her bags outside and refused to let her stay. He then claimed that a blue car picked her up. After that, she was never seen again. Days later, an elderly couple found her shoulder bag containing prescription medicine, an identification card, a food stamp card, and other personal belongings. Noticing that the prescription came from a Kroger on Covington Avenue in Pequa, they went and turned it in. The pharmacy then called Nikki's emergency contact, who then contacted the police. Unfortunately, the elderly couple was long gone by the time police arrived, and they've never been able to identify them. However, they told Kroger employees they found the bag on a covered bridge on Eldine Road, off County Road 25A, just north of Troy and five miles from where Nikki was last seen. Investigators obtained Nikki's cell phone records, but it hasn't been used since she vanished. She also never picked up her last paycheck from Waffle House. Nikki's ex-boyfriend stopped talking to police after making his initial statement. The day she vanished, Tammy received a text message from Nikki's phone indicating she was okay and that she and a friend were probably moving out of state. Whether the text came from Nikki or was just a ruse to throw off investigators is unclear. In 2017, investigators began digging in the backyard of her ex-boyfriend's property in the 1400 block of Croydon Road in Troy where she was last seen after cadaver dogs tracked the scent of human remains in his backyard. The ex-boyfriend's name has never been released. Two pieces of significant evidence was allegedly recovered and sent to a crime lab, but authorities have not revealed any further details. As of 2023, Nikki has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. On December 22, 2001, human remains were discovered under some brush at 2931 Trump Avenue Southeast in Canton, Ohio. 
The victim was estimated to be between 5 foot 4 inches and 6 foot tall and anywhere from 21 to 44 years old. The coroner ruled his death a homicide and said he was likely the victim of multiple gunshot wounds. When the remains were found, the farmer who owned the land said he had not plowed that particular field in about five years. This indicated that the victim was murdered sometime between 1996 and 2001. It's also of note that the bones were at the surface and not buried. This means that the victim was shot and left for dead. With no way to identify him, he became known as the Stark County John Doe. That same year, the victim's mitochondrial DNA was extracted from the bones but returned no matches from the database. They have also not found any missing persons who line up with this particular time frame. A forensic reconstruction was created by an artist with the Attorney General's Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Unfortunately, the Stark County John Doe is one of 100 unidentified bodies across Ohio, and as of 2023, this case remains unsolved. 